The Paraguayan War, also known as the War of the Triple Alliance, was an international military conflict in South America fought from 1864 to 1870 between Paraguay and the Triple Alliance of Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay. It is said to have caused approximately 400,000 deaths one of the highest ratios of fatalities to combatants of any war in South America in modern history. It was the longest and bloodiest interstate war in Latin American history. It particularly devastated Paraguay, which suffered catastrophic losses in population. Some claim that almost 70% of its adult male population died and was forced to cede territory to Argentina and Brazil. There are several theories regarding the origins of the war. The traditional view emphasizes the aggressive policy of Paraguayan President Francisco Solano López to gain control in the Platan Basin. See also Fortress of Humaita. Conversely, popular belief in Paraguay and Argentine revisionism since the 1960s blames the influence of the British Empire. The war has also been attributed to the after-effects of colonialism in South America, the struggle for physical power among neighboring nations over the strategic Rio de la Plata region, Brazilian and Argentine meddling in internal Uruguayan politics, Solano Lopez's efforts to help allies in Uruguay, as well as his presumed expansionist ambitions. Paraguay had recurring boundary disputes and tariff issues with Argentina and Brazil for many years. The war began in late 1864, at the aftermath of the Crusade de Libertadora in Uruguay, followed by combat operations between Brazil and Paraguay. Argentina and Uruguay entered in 1865, and it became the War of the Triple Alliance. The outcome of the war was the utter defeat of Paraguay. After it lost in conventional warfare, Paraguay conducted a drawn-out guerrilla-style resistance. A disaster that resulted in the destruction of the Paraguayan military and much of the civilian population. The guerrilla war lasted until Lopez was killed by Brazilian forces on 1 March 1870. Estimates of total Paraguayan losses range from 21,000 to 1,200,000. It took decades for Paraguay to recover from the chaos and demographic imbalance. In Brazil, the war helped bring about the end of slavery, moved the military into a key role in the public sphere and caused a ruinous increase of public debt, which took a decade to pay off, severely reducing the country's growth. It has been argued the war played a key role in the consolidation of Argentina as a nation, state. That country became South America's wealthiest nation, and one of the wealthiest in the world by the early 20th century. It was the last time that Brazil and Argentina took such an interventionist role in Uruguay's internal politics. Background Paraguay under Francia and López Paraguay under José Gaspar Rodríguez de Francia and Carlos Antonio López developed quite differently from other South American nations. These two leaders encouraged self-sufficient economic development, imposing a high level of isolation from neighboring countries. The regime of the Lopez family was characterized by pervasive and rigid centralism in production and distribution. There was no distinction between the public and the private sphere, and the Lopez family ruled the country as it would a large estate. The government exerted control on all exports. The export of yerba mate and valuable wood products maintained the balance of trade between Paraguay and the outside world. The Paraguayan government was extremely protectionist, never accepted loans from abroad and levied high tariffs against imported foreign products. This protectionism made the society self-sufficient, and it also avoided the debt suffered by Argentina and Brazil. Francisco Solano López, the son of Carlos Antonio López, replaced his father as the president dictator in 1862, and he generally continued the political policies of his father, militarily. 
Carlos Antonio López modernized and expanded industry in the Paraguayan army and greatly strengthened the strategic defenses of Paraguay by developing the fortress of Humaita. The government hired more than 200 foreign technicians, who installed telegraph lines and railroads to aid the expanding steel, textile, paper and ink, naval construction, weapons and gunpowder industries. The Ibisway foundry, completed in 1850, manufactured cannons, mortars and bullets of all calibers. River warships were built in the shipyards of Asuncion. Fortifications were built, especially along the APA River and in Gran Chaco. The work was continued by his son Francisco Solano. According to George Thompson, C. Lieutenant Colonel of Engineers in the Paraguayan Army prior and during the war, Lopez's government was comparatively a good one for Paraguay. Probably in no other country in the world has life and property been so secure as all over Paraguay during his reign. Crime was almost unknown, and when committed, immediately detected and punished. The mass of the people was, perhaps, the happiest in existence. They had hardly to do any work to gain a livelihood. Each family had its house or hut in its own ground. They planted, in a few days, enough tobacco, maize and mandioca for their own consumption. Having at every hut a grove of oranges, and also a few cows, they were almost throughout the year and a little necessity. The higher classes, of course, live more in an European way. George Thompson, c. On 6 February 1862, gathered in Asuncion, Solano Lopez, Minister of War, and the military chiefs coming from different parts of the country. On that occasion an expenditure budget for the war was elaborated and military mobilization was started, calling up all citizens between 17 and 40 years for military service. Major Pedro Duarte was appointed to command the military camp with Cerro Leon, about 90 kilometers from the capital and center of that mobilization, which already had between 4,000 and 5,000 recruits. On April 15, Duarte received orders from Solano Lopez to return to his old post of military commander of the village of Encarnacion, on the eastern border, to organize a military force of 10,000 soldiers. Regional politics Argentina and Brazil Since Brazil and Argentina had become independent, their struggle for hegemony in the Rio de la Plata profoundly marked the diplomatic and political relations among the countries of the region. Brazil, under the rule of the Portuguese, was the first country to recognize the independence of Paraguay in 1811 while Argentina was ruled by Juan Manuel Rosas, a common enemy of both Brazil and Paraguay. Brazil contributed to the improvement of the fortifications and development of the Paraguayan army, sending officials and technical help to Asuncion. As no roads linked the province of Mato Grosso to Rio de Janeiro, Brazilian ships needed to travel through Paraguayan territory going up the Rio Paraguay to arrive at Cuiaba. Many times, however, Brazil had difficulty obtaining permission from the government in Asuncion to sail those waterways. Brazil carried out three political and military interventions in Uruguay. In 1851, against Manuel Uribe to fight Argentine influence in the country, in 1855, at the request of the Uruguayan government and Venancia Flores leader of the Colorados, who were traditionally supported by the Brazilian Empire, and in 1864, against Athanasio Aguirre. This last intervention would light the fuse for the Paraguayan War. On 19 April 1863 former Colorado president of Uruguay Venancia Flores returned from his refuge in Argentina at the head of an army in the Crusada. Libertadora, intending to depose the Blanco president of Uruguay, Bernardo Barro. In April 1864 Brazil sent a diplomatic mission to Uruguay, led by José Antonio Suriva, to demand payment for damages caused to gaucho farmers in border conflicts with Uruguayan farmers. Uruguayan President Atanasio Aguirre, of the National Party, refused the Brazilian demands. Opposing forces according to some historians, 
Paraguay began the war with over 60,000 well-trained men, 38,000 of whom were currently under arms, 400 cannons, a naval squadron of 23 steamboats and five river navigating ships. However, recent studies suggest many problems. Although the Paraguayan army had between 70,000 and 100,000 men at the beginning of the conflict, they were badly equipped. Most infantry armaments consisted of inaccurate smoothbore muskets and carbines, slow to reload and short-ranged. The artillery was similarly poor. Military officers had no training or experience, and there was no command system, as all decisions were made by Lopez. Food, ammunition and armaments were scarce, with logistics and hospital care deficient or non-existent. At the beginning of the war the military forces of Brazil, Argentina and Uruguay were far smaller than Paraguay's. Argentina had approximately 8,500 regular troops and a naval squadron of four vaporess and one galita. Uruguay entered the war with fewer than 2,000 men and no navy. Many of Brazil's 16,000 troops were located in its southern garrisons. The Brazilian advantage, though, was in its navy, comprising 42 ships with 239 cannons and about 4,000 well-trained crew. A great part of the squadron had already met in the Rio de la Plata Basin, where it had acted under the Marquis of Tamandare in the intervention against Aguirre. Brazil, however, was unprepared to fight a war. Its army was disorganized. The troops it used in Uruguay were mostly armed contingents of gauchos and National Guard, while some Brazilian accounts of the war describe their infantry as volunteers. Other Argentinian revisionist and Paraguayan accounts disparage the Brazilian infantry as mainly recruited from slaves and the landless underclass, promised for land for enlisting. The cavalry was formed from the National Guard of Rio Grande do Sul, the Uruguayan conflict. On April 19, 1863, Uruguayan Gen. Venancio Flores, who was at the time an officer of the Argentine Army and leader of the Colorado Party of Uruguay, invaded his country, starting the Crusader Libertadora, with open support of the government of Buenos Aires, that supplied the rebels with arms ammunition and even 2,000 men. The objective of Flores's military expedition was to dethrone the Blanco government of Uruguay, which was allied with Paraguay and, therefore, enemy of Buenos Aires. Lopez sent a demand on 6 September, 1863 to the Argentine government asking for an explanation, but Buenos Aires denied all the claims. From that moment, mandatory military service was effected in Paraguay and, in February, 1864, an additional 64,000 men were drafted into the army. One year after the beginning of the Crusader Libertadora, in April, 1864, Brazilian Minister José Antonio Suriva arrived in Uruguayan waters with the Imperial Fleet to demand payment for damages caused to gaucho farmers in border conflicts with Uruguayan farmers. Uruguayan President Atanasio Aguirre, of the National Party, refused to accomplish the Brazilian demands, presenting instead their own reclamations while asking for help to the Paraguayan government. To settle the growing crisis, Solano Lopez offered himself as mediator of the Uruguayan crisis as he was a political and diplomatic ally of the Uruguayan Blancos, but the offer was turned down by Brazil. Brazilian soldiers in the northern boundaries of Uruguay started to provide help to Flores troops and hostilizing Uruguayan officers, while the Imperial fleet pressed hard on Montevideo. During those months, a treaty was signed between Brazil and the Argentine government at Buenos Aires. For mutual assistance in the Plate Basin crisis, the French minister at Uruguay during the crisis, Martin de Maifa, wrote to his government, Paraguay, the scarecrow of his enemies, is the last hope for the Blanco government, the real objective of the Brazil-Buenos Aires alliance, and the arbiter of the current situation, Martin Maifa to Edouard Ruin de Lies.
Montevideo, August 13, 1864, Minister Sariva, on August 4, 1864, sent an ultimatum to the Uruguayan government. Either they comply to the Brazilian demands, or the Brazilian army would take retaliations. The Paraguayan government was informed of all this and sent to Brazil another ultimatum, which stated in part, the government of the Republic of Paraguay will consider any occupation of the Oriental Territory, i.e., Uruguay, as an attempt against the equilibrium of the states of the plate which interests the Republic of Paraguay as a guarantee for its security peace, and prosperity, and that it protests in the most solemn manner against the act, freeing itself for the future of every responsibility that may arise from the present declaration. José Berge, Paraguayan Chancellor, to Viana de Lima, Brazilian Minister to the Paraguayan Government. August 30, 1864, the Brazilian government, probably believing that the Paraguayan threat would not surpass the diplomatic sphere, answered the ultimatum in September 1, 1864, stating that they will never abandon the duty of protecting the lives and interests of Brazilian subjects. But the Paraguayan government, two days later, insisted with its answer that if Brazil takes the measures protested against in the note of August 30, 1864, Paraguay will be under the painful necessity of making its protest effective. Despite the Paraguayan notes and ultimatums, on October 12, 1864, Brazilian troops under the command of Gen. João Propicio Mena Barreto invaded Uruguay, thus marking the beginning of the hostilities. One month later, on 12 November 1864, the Paraguayan ship Tacuari captured the Brazilian ship Marques de Olinda, which had sailed up the Rio Paraguay to the province of Mato Grosso, making its protests effective. The followers of Colorado Party leader Venancia Flores, who had the support of Argentina and Brazil, deposed Aguirre and the Blanco government of Uruguay and on 28 January. 1865, Flores signed a formal alliance with Brazil against Paraguay. Months later, on 18 March 1865, Paraguay declared war on Argentina. By then the Uruguayan War was over, with Venancia Flores ruling in Uruguay now aligned with Brazil and Argentina.